Okay, let me just make sure that we are live. I think we are. Does anyone see a sign? <laughs> We're not live yet. <laughs> okay. Well, you send me a message on Skype when we are. All right, Girl Scouts, I think we're live. Um, thank you for tuning in, tuning in again to our Girls in the Woods Week a celebration of women who have outdoor careers. I'm Angie Madsen, the Outdoor Program Specialist, um, and Georgia Bossy is here with me again. All week we've been running uh, question and answer sessions with women who have different outdoor careers. And tonight we are talking about oceanography with Sarah Gilly. Um, we're talking a bit about scientific databases, research, what the future of environmental science looks like. Um, so Georgia is our Girls in the Woods director, and she also has a lot of experience with environmental and population biology, um, creating informational technology with scientific databases. And Georgia and Sarah actually know each other because Georgia was Sarah's troop leader um, in Colorado, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're all Girl Scouts here. <laughs> um, this is supposed to be um, pretty interactive. If you would like to ask any questions, you can comment um, on this video and we will get those questions answered for you. But we have a couple questions from earlier um, that we'll start off with. But first, I think we should just um, one at a time say uh, who you are, what you study or what you do, your experience with any of the topics. So Sarah, would you like to go first? Yeah, my name is Sarah Gilly. I'm a physical oceanographer. And that means that I study where currents go in the ocean, the, the physics of how the ocean moves, where currents go, how heat is moved through the ocean, and how the ocean is changing, how the climate of the ocean is changing over time. So I use a lot of different tools to do that. Um, I work quite a bit with satellite data, which means that I am not necessarily working outdoors, but oceanographers also rely a lot on um, shipboard observations, going to sea to collect data, being out on the water, gathering observations. That's great. And Georgia, I know you have a lot of outdoor experience, but <laughs> can you share a little bit about what you've done? So in addition to working with awesome girls who love the outdoors as much as I do, um, I have had the opportunity to work as a Colorado Division of Wildlife Officer, as a intern with National Center for Atmospheric Research, where we studied hurricane um, formation, looking at what they call drop on data, where this airplane dropped a module that had test equipment in it and relayed the temperatures and wind direction and things up to the airplane as it dropped. And we worked with that data. And I guess that was where I started realizing how powerful data is in working with outdoor data, because it allows you to learn a lot about it and to also make predictions. And out of that same science that I was doing back in the late 70s and 1980, um, we now have pretty decent ways of being able to predict hurricanes, which we could hardly do at all back in 1980. So it's powerful. I've had the opportunity to work with all kinds of biologists, with botanists and um, wildlife biologists building databases to protect endangered species. I've worked with foresters to build databases to help manage forests. I've worked with horses and burrows people to help manage the wild horses on our land uh, that the BLM manages. I've worked with archaeologists to help look at sites and help uh, site uh, where potential sites might be based on the types of things we learned about the typical sites that were known. Um, I've worked with the fire teams on using data to produce maps of where fires were to go and where we might want to do some management of uh, types of woody uh, ecosystems that could 
easily ignited the fires too. So it's been really fascinating. It's been a great opportunity. Also, I get to go outdoors with all of these folks and look at the problems they're trying to do with data outdoors. So it's been an awesome career. And I'm retired now and I'm really wanting other girls to have the opportunity to have awesome careers in the outdoors as well. Me too. And it's exciting what you said about how much um, research has changed and how we can see things and measure things that we couldn't before. Imagine what it'll be like in 20 years. So imagine it's 20 years from now, more or less, um, and you have the ability to explore anywhere in the ocean. We had a Girl Scout ask both of you, um, if you could explore anywhere in the ocean, where would you go and why? So why don't, Sarah, do you want to start? Oh, that's a great question. And it took me a while to think about this, but um, it's nice to think, where would we go if we, if we weren't limited by technology? I think one of the biggest challenges we face is understanding what happens um, around Antarctica and Greenland, because if ice on the ice shelves around Antarctica and Greenland melt, they, they help to retain ice on Antarctica and Greenland. And so as we lose ice around Antarctica, as the floating ice shelves melt, that can lead to um, ice on the continent, ice sheets on, the, on Antarctica moving into the ocean and sea level rise. And so we really are desperate to know what happens under the ice shelves around Antarctica. And if we had the ability to send robots into these um, cavities under the ice shelves and look at what was happening to the ocean, how fast the currents are going and how warm the water is, we could learn a lot more about what the potential for change is around Antarctica and Greenland too. So that's my wish. What about you, Georgia? Do you have a magic wish of visiting anywhere in the ocean? You know, there's so many awesome places and I really have not had a lot of experience other than from the shore or maybe a mile out in a fishing boat. Um, and so the, the experiences just near the shore are really incredible. But I think getting a chance to go under the ocean, um, maybe off the coast of Peru might be a really interesting place mm. because there is so much wildlife and it's a place where El Nino meets the shores of South America. I think that would be a really fascinating place. I think so too. Um, so Sarah, you mentioned how um, with temperatures changing across earth, we're getting changes in ice shelves um, on our poles. Mm -hmm. So how are oceanographers able to measure changes in temperature or changes in ice in, in the poles and um, how, how do they put it in ways that the general public can understand? Let me, um, let me share a few pictures and try and answer that. Um, what we often hear in the media is, so I'm gonna try and share my screen and um, see if I can get this to work. Um, See, share. There we go. Um, what we often hear in the media is that this year has been this, or last year, 2019 was the second warmest year on record. And we can look at how temperatures have changed over time and how, um, how the temperature of the earth has changed. When people talk about that, they're talking about the temperature at the earth's surface, the bottom of the atmosphere, the area where we live. Um, and the question is, how's the ocean changing? So, um, so surface temperatures on land and ocean have warmed over time. Um, and sea surface temperature has warmed too. This is from satellite data. And we're looking here at sea surface temperatures from 1950 up to the present. And you can see that temperatures uh, at the ocean surface have gotten to be, um, well, they've gone from a a value of minus 0.4 relative to the average up to plus 0.2. So about a six tenths of a degree warming over this time period for the global ocean. But the question is really um, what's happening in the ocean interior? Um, and to look at that, we try and we wanna measure the heat content of the ocean. What's the 
heat or the temperature averaged not just at the surface of the ocean, but over the top kilometer, the top um, 2,000 meters, some amount of ocean. This, is, this plot is looking at changes in the heat content of the ocean over 700, the top 700 meters. Um, and it shows that the heat content of the ocean has increased. Now, that's, that's a quantity that doesn't make a lot of sense. But the real question then you might have is, how do you measure that? And to do that, I want to skip ahead a little bit. Um, so if you want to measure the, the ocean, normally what we have to do is to go out in a ship. So we take a ship, and this ship here is um, a ship that belongs to the institution where I work, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. The Sally Ride is um, a relatively new ship that's named after the astronaut Sally Ride, who was a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And um, you can see that the ship has this big structure on the back. Um, it's able to hold a very large winch and to lower um, large instruments over the side. And so what people normally do is to take something like this, um, this package of instruments. This is called a rosette and it's about the size of a small car. And they lower it off the side of a ship down to the sea floor and then use that, it has electronic sensors on it, and they use that to, we use it to measure the temperature and the saltiness of the ocean. That is really slow and sort of tedious, and we don't get a lot of measurements. So if you look from 1972 to the present, you can see all the measurements we've collected in the Southern Ocean, and they're sort of gappy. We just haven't managed to measure every week or every day to really see how the ocean's changing. And so What's made a big difference is that we now have robotic sensors. Um, and these are called Argo floats. And they are able to go measure the ocean independently. So we're getting, let me see if I can show you how these work. Uh, so the Argo float has a satellite antenna on the top. Um, it has a temperature probe and um, a salinity sensor and it's got batteries and then it has a pump that lets it change its volume so that it can change its buoyancy and move up and down through the water. So at the, it can move from the surface of the ocean down to 2000 meters, one and a quarter miles. Um, if it goes too deep, it would be crushed and destroyed, but we try to avoid that. Um, and so we have these go into the ocean. I'm gonna skip that. Um, so they're dropped off a ship the floats, they go down to 1,000 meters, they drift along with currents, and then they dive down to 2,000 meters and come up, and they measure the temperature and salinity. And so every 10 days, a float will do one of these, and we'll get new measurements um, that cover the global ocean. So now we're getting measurements every, every 10 days all over the world. And that's showing us that the ocean, that's giving us the evidence to say that the ocean is warming up, that it's really increasing its temperature. So I'll stop sharing there. Let's talk a little more. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, I don't know where to go from here. Georgia, do you have, I know this is probably different um, technology and you didn't work with oceans, but do you want to add anything about technology in the future? Well, this sort of parallels the technology we're using back in 1980 to uh, measure what was happening in the atmosphere of the ocean that allowed mm -hmm. us to start predicting the path of, of formation and, and tracking of hurricanes. Uh, I suspect some of the data that uh, the technology Sarah just described is probably contributing to what we're doing now. And hugely, the satellite data is adding to a lot of our science, especially about global systems. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also adding to our knowledge of how ocean-based animals um, choose the paths of where they're going to. Uh, we also are learning more about uh, what causes El Nino and the climate changes that occur as the uh, Pacific Ocean sloshes back and forth between the Indian Ocean 
and the banks of South America and the changes in ocean temperature that go on there. Right. We see temperature changes on the time scale of El Nino, and we see temperature changes that happen over much longer time periods. And we'd like to tease apart what causes those and and how sensitive the climate system is to that those types of changes. So what drew you into this type of work? You both have very specific and scientific experiences and even just one particular robot having that much knowledge about um, how did you get there? What made you interested? And Sarah, why don't you go first? Yeah, I would, well, I was, um, I grew up in Colorado, I did, um, I was a Girl Scout, I was active, I did a lot outdoors, I was really interested in the environment and I wanted to find a science that would let me um, contribute to our understanding of the environment. And so I poked around and looked at what the options were and I was really excited by the possibilities, the open questions that were available in oceanography. And I, I think in all the years I've been in oceanography, there's still lots of great open questions and lots of ways to make a contribution. So I felt like this was an area of science where I could really, there was a lot to be learned and a, a lot of opportunities to contribute to what would be helpful to know to, to advance our understanding of the environment and the climate system. Did you need to study like a specific, did you go to college for this? I, I went to college thinking that I wanted to study science, but I wasn't completely sure what I wanted to do. I was a physics major. Mm -hmm. And physics, in some ways, is a great way to be undecided. It teaches a lot of skills, but it doesn't, um, it opens a lot of doors for many possible futures. And so I went from being a physics major as an undergraduate to going to graduate school in physical oceanography. So I did an undergraduate degree in physics. I did a PhD in physical oceanography. Wow. It's just like progression, right? Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you, Georgia? What did I'm curious what you studied and how you found your way? Well, I started out as a kid thinking I wanted to be a uh, national park ranger because I lived very close to Rocky Mountain National Park and I just loved to go on the ranger walks uh, where they told us all about the wildlife and the trees and things. And I loved to go hiking in the mountains and to climb up the tall mountains and look out from there. And then in high school, um, well, in, in middle school, I started learning about field surveying and the math of measuring landscapes. And in high school, I got interested in computers um, and had the opportunity to work with some of the uh, first uh, computers that IBM was putting out. Um, and so I enrolled in a vocational class in business data processing. And I got out of that class and I decided I was bored with business data processing. <laughs> what I really wanted to do with science computers. Uh, and since I was interested in biology and trees and animals and things, I majored in environmental biology and um, had the opportunity as a result of that to work with the Colorado Division of Wildlife as a wildlife officer. And I got a job with uh, INCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, uh, where I got to study hurricanes. And I really hadn't any idea that I was interested in hurricanes until I did that. But it suddenly opened up to me the power of what you can do with computers. And um, when I found out that BLM was looking for people with both biology and computers, as a background, uh, that really charged me up and I applied and got the job with them and spent the next 35 years working with them, a little bit more than that even. Um, so I had the wonderful opportunity to work with biologists and scientists of all kinds, with map makers, an incredible swath of people who are doing outdoor work and go out and work with them to see what kind of data they were collecting and to help them figure out ways that we could analyze that data to give them um, results that told them something about what they were doing, how to manage the forest, how to stop a fire, how to mm. and what the right carrying capacity of wild horses on the land was. 
And uh, so it was a very uh, full experience in all of those different things that I ended up being interested in. So, yeah. I like how you both have the theme. I think it's very common that, um, you know, when you're a Girl Scout, you don't know exactly what you want to do someday. And instead you just get a series of different nudges that leads you to a passion. So I think that's great. Um, this is maybe a tough question, but um, at Girl Scouts, we build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about an experience in your work um, that made you realize that you were making the world a better place. My goodness. <laughs> um, I should have warned you. <laughs> it's okay. I think okay, um, <laughs> the work I do, it asks really big questions about how, how the ocean contributes to the climate system and how the climate system is changing. And, um, and that's led to surprises. We, when we first started getting these Argo floats, the precursors to Argo floats, and we hadn't really explored what they could do. I did some early analysis on them and, and realized that what they were showing was that the temperatures we were measuring from those floats, from the floats, were warmer than all the temperatures in the historic data, and that clearly implied the ocean was warming up. And that really set the stage for thinking about how much the ocean is changing and what we need to do to monitor it. Um, and how important that is to, to contribute to our global assessment of the climate system, of how it's changing and how we plan for changes. I think the factor of planning is so important part of the work in the outdoors um, because we may not be able to change the way the world is changing, but we can prepare for it. Uh, mm -hmm. that gives us courage to go into the next stage of whatever our world is headed toward, uh, knowing what we are going to need to be able to work with mm -hmm. in the world. Um, and whether it means moving homes further away from the banks as uh, Arctic areas melt, or whether it means planning for better harvests of timber and still being able to preserve the animals and the birds that are dependent on those forests um, and balancing out all of those aspects of what um, what we want to be able to do with the natural resources that we're managing especially on public lands but even on private lands it's a it's a big issue of being able to manage it for the best possible uses so given that there are so many big questions and big answers, um, what are some small ways that Girl Scouts can protect our oceans and protect the environment now in their everyday life? So, um, good question. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the things that we hear a lot about, and I think it is a, a way that people can really make a contribution mm -hmm. is is that we um, in society in the US and in all of the world, people in coastal areas end up um, dropping stuff that ends up getting swept into the ocean. So we have this increase in plastics in the ocean that have impacts on ecosystems. We would like to cut down on how much stuff is going into the ocean. So paying attention to where your trash goes, what you're dumping, picking up, can make a difference in, in helping keep plastics out of the ocean. On a broader sense, we're concerned about the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the potential effects in the ocean that that can lead to ocean acidification. And we can all do our bit to try and contribute to a, a changing energy economy that might use, produce less or depend less on producing, emitting carbon dioxide and more on renewable energy. They're big challenges for everybody and things that will keep us all occupied for many years. I think one of the things that Girl Scouts can do is 
back it up is getting accustomed to the reduce, reuse, recycle of all of the things that we use. Um, when you buy a set of clothes um, and then just throw out what you previously were wearing, that just goes in the landfills. It um, contributes to the need for harvesting trees and other resources to replace um, the things. And if we are able to better use the resources that we are harvesting, um, it'll be better for our ecosystem in general. But also Absolutely. being familiar with, um, with the science and understanding how the little decisions we make each day contribute to the overall picture of the world. Yeah, I've actually mm -hmm. heard um, a lot of other additions to reduce, reuse, recycle with the first one being refuse. So if you don't need the paper napkins, don't take the paper mm -hmm. napkins. Mm -hmm. um, refuse buying new things that you don't need or taking free things that you don't need. I like it, it's simple. <laughs> mm -hmm. So since you were both Girl Scouts, maybe you can close your eyes and reminisce on that time and um, imagine that um, just, I'm assuming that there are plenty of Girl Scouts in our council who are interested in environmental science or oceanography, um, any of the things that you talked about. Do you have any advice on what they can do now, be, say between the ages of 12 and 18? Um, how can preteens and teenage, what, what is something that they can do um, if they think that they're interested in studying these topics or working in a career related to them? Great question. Um, so first there's the question, what to do in school? And the answer is to, to keep learning, to focus on building a good foundation in math and science and physics and build good writing skills to convey the descriptions of what you're doing. So to really um, embrace everything that you're being asked to do in school and learn. But that may not feel like enough. It may feel like it's putting off the real work and you can also start reading and exploring um, and learning more about um, the science that you might want to pursue or the activities you might want to do. There's a lot of good outreach material on the web, which is a good starting point. And um, maybe Georgia has other suggestions or you do, Angie. Oh, I, think, I think those are good suggestions. I think uh, exploring things you're interested in, whether it's science or whether it's like how to design a nice campground. Mm -hmm. um, can be all ways to lead you to an outdoor career. Um, talk to people who are in those fields and find out what they like about them and what they don't like about them. Mm -hmm. Recognize that there's a lot of jobs that can be a combination of outdoors and something more indoors like computer work or um, what can be combined with outdoor work. Um, there's certainly a lot of information that is based on um, environmental issues in the law as well. Um, so follow what you're interested in and be willing to switch around and learn about a lot of different things because I certainly didn't know for sure where I wanted to land until I just sort of found myself there. Yeah, I guess I would add um, looking at the outdoor and the STEM badges. I know we have an eco badge for every level and a lot of it can be relevant. Um, we have the new fun patch, outdoor career exploration program, if you're really looking for tips on thinking about future careers. But um, I know we only have, I guess, one minute left. So I would like to end on this question, um, which is just what is one of your favorite parts about um, the work that you've done, just a moment that makes you smile or a, something in your everyday work routine that makes you smile. What I love is the work I do is super collaborative. I spend a lot of time talking to people, puzzling over really hard problems with other people who have a lot to contribute. And I learn so much from the colleagues I work with. I found that I had opportunities to work with kids quite a bit along the way. And I think that's always been one of my favorite things. Uh, since I was a 
teenager and started babysitting for people and took on a Girl Scout troop when I was in college and uh, raised a son and now grandchildren. And uh, along the way, I also did uh, volunteer work with Salmon Watch and various other organizations that took kids outside and certainly a lot of Girl Scouting along the way. And that's been, to me, the most fun and uh, rewarding thing in, in my life. Well, one of my favorite parts of my job <laughs> is getting to meet a lot of other inspiring women, just like you two. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us, Sarah and Georgia. Um, I know that there is so much more we could dig into. So I encourage Girl Scouts to ask questions of anyone that they know who has who has a career related to the outdoors or is retired from a career related to the outdoors, because there's so much that can inspire you. Um, this is our final panel again for the week. So go back and watch the others if you missed them um, and start the outdoor career exploration patch if this inspired you because maybe you'll be a, an environmental scientist or an oceanographer someday. <laughs> so thank you all so much for tuning in and thank you both for joining in our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank Good you. night.